Welcome to the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Flynnhart Glomgold, and joining me as always is my indentured servant, Kyle JCRB Cross. <laughs> Hello, sir. You're, you're... You may be wondering what those four letters are. The thing is, he's trying to save up for a middle name, but I buy him at random. This year, I think I'm going to get him a three. Have fun with that one. <laughs> Kurt McKiltz. It's you. <laughs> I'm a terrible, a terrible voice person ever. <laughs> I've been sitting on that since we recorded the last show. Uh, that was, that was glorious. Yes. <laughs> but now the joke is officially running to the ground. So yeah, I yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. And now I can't use the thumbnail for this week because we already used it for last week. <laughs> which was That's fine. was a, a great thumbnail. I, I'm pr- I'm kind of proud of that one, even though it was a very quick job that I just threw together super fast. Oh, I love it, especially you hiding behind the couch with the others. I, I mean, I had to put me somewhere. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't think of anything other than yeah, well, well, right here. I was like, I was trying to put me on someone else's face, and I'm like, well, no, it makes more sense if I'm kind of like. Uh, separate from everybody else and just like grinning stupidly. <laughs> Aaliyah saw the thumbnail and she goes, Ian, what have you done? And I said, no, it's what Kyle did. And it's glorious. <laughs> I did the thumbnail. Yes. But you brought the Flynn heart. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> uh, man. Well, we have a lot of questions this week. We do, we do. If you would like to contribute to that pile of questions, email us at bumblecast at yahoo.com. Tweet to us on Twitter at bumblecast. If you're a patron, go over to the SQ and A channel over on the Discord. And if you want your question answered sooner rather than later, become a $5 patron either through patreon.com backslash bumblecast, Kofi, that's ko hyphen dot com backslash bumblecast, or become a YouTube member. Just click that little join button and select your denomination. Uh, please make sure to check out the Q&A master list over at BumbleKing.com just to make sure that your question hasn't already been answered. With all that aside, let's get to the priority Q&A. All right, let's do it to it here with Scurvy Pirate Hogs starting us off on the priority questions. We all know that the Death Egg is a parody of the Death Star, but in an episode of Sonic Boom, an alternate version of Eggman had a laser sword, so... What do you think the chances are that Eggman is secretly a huge Star Wars nerd? No, oh, he absolutely is. I don't think it was a secret. I mean, he wears it on his shoulder pretty clearly. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big Empire fan. <laughs> there was a rendition of the ending to Sonic 2, or rather the ending to um, Wing Fortress Zone, where Eggman jumps into the little rocket ship and takes off to the Death Egg. Mm-hmm. And in that comic rendition, they turned it into an x-wing it looks basically. it actually like, looks kind of like an x-wing style it's a little hard to plane. tell just being from the side but yeah it yeah, does kind of look like yeah. that sort of style of ship yeah yeah i think that's what they were going for um so no, he he absolutely is a star wars nerd and is the type who would actually try to figure out how lightsaber works you know how does the beam know when to stop it? no the force is not an acceptable explanation <laughs> it must be science he he's like one person in the world who likes midichlorians as an explanation he likes that he wants to figure out the quantifiable variables yes of how much energy that a midichlorian can dictate through a body and yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. no he, yes. he's the super obnoxious hard sci-fi star wars nerd yeah and he identifies greatly with palpatine except he's not a force user so he wouldn't no, believe in the he, force, he, he, but the but the he, evil is there. I mean, if anything, if he has any knock against Palpatine, it's just he's so drab. You're running an empire. Put a little bit of razzle dazzle in that cloak, for pity's sake. Yes, yes. You need presentation. That's what you need. You always need presentation. Mm-hmm. If you're a villain, that's what. That's the important thing. Here's a question from Danny the Light. You know how Eggman does his performed announcement theatrics every time he's back to doing a scheme. Does he practice it before broadcasting what he's doing with Cubot and Norbot as an audience? Or is that all freestyle? In fact, do all villains practice their theatrical speech when revealing themselves? Or do they freestyle? And which one do you think has the most do- fun doing the theatrical? 
I'm here and doing another scheme part of villainy. Wow, this is a conveniently <laughs> placed question. <laughs> yes, it is. <clears throat> um, I think Eggman is a little bit of both. The big broadcasts, like in SA2 when he holds the world ransom with the arc, I'm pretty sure he wrote that script. He he prepared for that. If not in front of Orbot and Cuba, then in front of a mirror. He wanted to make sure to get that one right. But it just is kind of part of who he is. So as things go along, it just kind of comes out. See Sonic Heroes when the Chaotix finally confront him. And instead of, you know, trying to weasel his way out of it or barter, he just straight up declares, once I've conquered the world, I will pay you. <laughs> which is very funny. That is the absolute wrong way to do it, which is the exact right way for Eggman to do it. Yes, so yes. he practices, but it comes naturally. <laughs> uh, Rough and Tumble, they practice, they, they brainstorm stuff, but it's not like it's a dedicated routine. They're, they they feel like it's such a natural part of their duo that they'll throw it out there. What you don't see is all the times when they try to mug someone and they flub the line and then the guy gets away because they're arguing over how they should have done it. We've yeah. only seen the successful takes. <laughs> uh, Starline is just, he's the type of guy to study the script until he's burned a, pol a hole in the page by reading it too hard. He aspires to be like Dr. Eggman. He wants to be Dr. Eggman. So he wants to capture that same quality. And I think at this point, he's kind of gotten it down pat. He, it's become ingrained, but he had to work towards it. He was not there initially. <laughs> Have you heard the tragedy of Gerald Robotnik the Wise? <laughs> 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 I have to give credit to the chat for that one. That was not me. <laughs> Here's a question from Speedweed. Now, as with before, I'm not too sure if you're familiar with the Little Nightmares games, but what always gets me is that the first game had its own comic and it had much more original content going on with it. It introduced some new characters, it had some interesting stories, it was overall expanding the world of the games by a little. And it wasn't just a straight-up advertisement like Little Nightmare 2's mini-comics. Long story short, though, it got cancelled due to what I can only assume was a lack of interest at the time, but given the second game's popularity and the sheer potential to expand on the overall Ultra Tour of the Worlds, not to mention Bandai Namco's interest in continuing to delve into the franchise, would it be worth it to make another series of comics for it? Would you be interested in trying your hand and writing it? Or is it a little out of your comfort zone? Uh, okay, let's tackle this one in order. Do you know anything about the Little Nightmare series? I do not, actually, other than Speed okay. Reed having mentioned it in the, uh, in the Discord many many a time, but I'm not familiar uh, really with it otherwise. Are you, are you? Yeah, I watched a couple of playthroughs of oh, okay. the two games. The two games I'm aware of. If there's more in the series, I'm not familiar with them. But basically, you are a extremely tiny child going through this larger than life world full of horrible, horrible, horrible things, usually completely without any recourse other than to run and to hide. Um, the best I could sum it up is like a stealth platformer. So it's like kind of like limbo, maybe, maybe, or the, but or, or in, but if it, in, inside i think was what it was called those, yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 like, those like two games those, they're yeah. very similar yeah they're very yeah like limbo and inside okay that's what they that's what uh speed is saying in the chat he's confirming yeah. that so yeah okay okay i mean i i hate to say you know stealth platformer because that makes it sound like almost splinter cell and it's not <laughs> no no, like that. no no yeah i know what you mean but um so i am familiar in passing i am i don't i didn't even know there were tie-in comics um the first one I would imagine either like Speedweed thought it didn't have enough support to keep going or comics are expensive to make. Yeah. And if you're using it as an advertising tool and it's not bringing in enough revenue to justify its cost, it might just be something's got to go. And that's it. The fact that the second book was more of a straight up ad really makes me think that's what it was that they wanted to use the book to expand the lore it couldn't support it. And so, okay, here's your ad in a comic form to reach a broader audience, but we budgeted for that and it's succinct. That's me speculating from the outside. I don't know if that's true or not. 
Yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand. Comics are a pretty expensive prospect, even just digitally. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. cheap, you know? These, these, uh, these artists, man, they want money. What the heck? These writers and these <laughs> artists? What? What? How dare they? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, credit to Studio Aether when we did Tales of Aether. Uh, they paid industry rate. Wow. So, oh. <laughs> Dang. Like they, they, they went the games... full on board to make sure that this was they're... not a cheap cash in. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, the we game's got, done we... quite well, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the the comic itself has star talent in it. Yes. So, um, you get what yeah. you pay for. <laughs> exactly. In regards of expanding the universe of that, now I've not read the comics, so I don't know how they presented the story. But I would be iffy about that, only insofar as the little nightmares are very atmospheric in their storytelling there's no dialogue there's no text right it's all about you interacting with the environment and so there's a degree of mystery and surrealism to them and i don't know if that would necessarily translate to comics which are a much more static form of storytelling it could be done i'm just it would depend on what kind of story you're trying to tell and what information you're trying to convey so I'm going to put that as a maybe hmm. as for working on it. Sure. I am an absolute baby when it comes to that type of game. I couldn't play it to save my life. And I have to like bolster myself to watch it. That degree of separation makes it a little easier, but I can dish it out. No problem. <laughs> I have no problem being the one hiding around the corner and going, boo, I'm an absolute hypocrite. <laughs> Nobody cut that out. Nobody cut that out of context. Eh, whatever. Do what you want. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I'm obviously, I'm kind of inviting people to cut that out of context. <laughs> I am an absolute hypocrite. Ian Flynn, 2021. <laughs> hey, I try to be honest with the people. Yes, but like, I think it for me, it's a matter of control. Like, if I'm playing the game. And the game is built around scaring you and taking away control and putting you in peril. There's a direct connection there that gets to me. If I am the one writing it, I am in control. I know where the boo is going to happen. I know how it's going to play out. So I can't scare myself necessarily. And that's <laughs> the difference. I wouldn't necessarily be able to read the thing to proofread it because I might go, Ugh, but you know, in, in theory, sure, I could I could do one of those if they were interested. Yeah. Here's a question from Noni. Could chaos get infected with the middle virus? And if so, how bad of a situation are we talking? No, chaos would be safe. Chaos, can, can, you cannot have liquid metal and water. Liquid metal and water don't mix. Like, he would be, like, the only safe thing on the planet. <laughs> well, him and uh, Mephilus, right? Or yeah, in, yeah, 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 in, yeah. Infinite, one of them? Which one of them? I don't remember. Mephilus. Mephilus, okay. I don't know. They're both the same damn character. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Mephilus is way better. I, I don't. I... <laughs> Vaguely hedgehog-shaped type characters who are evil <laughs> and have unlimited power. Godlike being powers. Whatever. I don't know, man. These, I don't know. The amount of ham Dan Green brought to Mephilus could feed a nation. <laughs> His Mephilus is fantastic. Well, I mean, he's Dan Green. Liam right? O'Brien was wasted on Infinite. He could have had so much he, more Liam, fun with him. God, you're, you're so right on that, actually. I didn't even realize it was Liam O'Brien until I was told they later. Because too much of a filter Because they didn't him. put it. I know. And the, yeah, they didn't. They didn't do anything with him. It's like you had freaking Liam O freaking Brian on board and you couldn't you couldn't do it. What? You're not going to just let him absolutely just go ham, go totally, totally ham. Come on. Come on. I mean, if you listen real close, if, if you try to listen past the filter, you can hear him doing it. But he just you don't get enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, if you're wondering who Liam O'Brien is, he's uh one of the guys on Critical Role, and uh, it's just in my mind because most recently he was also uh, Nightcrawler on Wolverine and the X-Men. 
where he does the same exact voice he did for campaign two of critical role <laughs> which is very very weird very weird and he's also says okay thank you i forgot about that one uh let's see here's a question from unknowing frown while sonic and the freedom fighters had their memories of the old continuity did they remember the people that were lost forever so many characters had loved ones that were either erased from existence or replaced and i always thought the implications of that were unsettling uh absolutely agreed and that's why i hated the memory angle yep and pushed really hard that they ultimately for would forget everything because that is just so much baggage that we did not need <laughs> so you were trying to get rid of the baggage not add even more <laughs> yeah so i would like to think that they were so busy during events that they didn't have time to dwell on the past memories and thus all that implied, but it's certainly possible. But again, ultimately all of those memories faded away. So the most they would have had was this lingering notion of, yeah, there was something there, but it's completely gone now so that they didn't have to suffer with it. Alrighty. And here's a question from Scruffy Matt. I recently had an absolutely delightful experience playing the Sonic 1 Master System remake. Thank you again, Kyle, for introducing me to it. And no, I will never shut up about it. Well, good, because uh, the Sonic 1 and 2 SMS remakes are freaking awesome. So I was wondering what some of your favorite Sonic fan games are. I'm not sure whether or not you can answer this one due to your no fan works policy, but I'd imagine that there are some that would be okay, like the Sonic 3D Blast Director's Cut or Angel Island Revisited, perhaps? Uh, yeah, the director's cut is safe territory. Um, I think that's really super cool. Yeah. That, oh, what is the gentleman's name? The, yeah, the amount of effort that went into polishing the game so many years after the fact, just out of kindness. John Burton is, there we go. John Burton. Thank you. Yes. M M Mr. Burton's work is greatly appreciated and it's just, it's just super cool. It just, it's a nice, happy thing in the universe, you know? Yeah. And it's really well uh, done. It definitely does improve Sonic 3D Blast considerably. <laughs> and then Air, of course, because everyone's hungry for a Sonic 3 and Knuckles remaster. Uh, there I, was a project where they were redoing one of the Game Gear games in a Master System format. They and have, like, they've been, there's been ports to, of like Sonic Chaos, I believe, has got a maybe that's what port to master system which like fully is redone barely a graphics port. and everything oh okay no this is are we are we talking about the sonic one and two eight bit remakes that scruffy's mentioned i think triple maybe. oh wait no triple trouble triple tr that's right triple trouble got a like a 16 bit remake there we go there we go yeah yeah okay i remember yeah. that and that's no small amount of work no that's that's that a, practically a whole new game <laughs> and to do it just out of love of the franchise it's just that's all really really super cool mm -hmm. and there's um one game out there that's built on the doom engine sonic robo blast 2 okay i think that's the one where people can just like custom add characters yes and i think i saw somebody on twitter had a tangle designed for that and she could just like grapple all over the place with her tail mm-hmm and it looked fluid and fun and cool. And it's like, this, this is just freaking cool. <laughs> uh, there was a, there was a bit where people were taking the generations engine and rebuilding some of the other games, like shadow of all things. The un our unleashed project for, yeah, for yeah, Sonic yeah. generations. Yeah. Taking the speed levels from unleashed and porting them to generations it was nice. It looked really cool. It was a lot of fun. But there was, there was also one where there was also a few shadow stages. Yeah, I think there's well. been some ports of other other stages that have made the jump over. So all of that is just super freaking cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sonic Robo Blast 2 is like the OG awesomeness of the Sonic fan game history. <laughs> like there's there's just so much stuff with that. Um, so many mods and so many extra characters and stuff. It's it's a pretty wild what sort of gameplay fluidity and stuff you can pull off with uh with the doom engine of all things 
<laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> and it works so well for 3D Sonic. Like, if the 3D Sonic games have gone for more of the style of Sonic Robo Blast 2, things might be a little different nowadays. But, eh, it, it's this is where we are now. So, but I like Sonic, having Sonic Robo Blast 2 as it's like its own fan made thing. It even has a cart spinoff, crying out loud, which is awesome. I love I love SRB two cart. <laughs> uh, let's see what other ones. I mean, I'm a big fan of Air Sonic Three Air, and I think I think that that will probably remain the superior way of playing Sonic Three and Knuckles even after the official remaster comes out. Gauntlet Thrown. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. It's a tough act to follow. I mean, there's so many just little customizations and options and the, the mod support actually also for, for uh, air is really outstanding. So I don't know, man, it's going to be a tough act to follow. We'll see if uh, they can throw in half as many options as, uh, as air has. Um, Let's see. Eh, those are really some of the ones that I like best. Some, some of the older ROM hacks are pretty fun. Like a, Replacing Sonic and Sonic Two with uh, with Sally, that's pretty. It's pretty neat. And there's also one with Bunny, I think, and Amy. So it's fun to have those games. It's a it's a familiar experience, but you know, having a little bit of extra gameplay, a little bit of a different gameplay twist on it with uh, with new characters. That's pretty. It's always pretty cool and a lot of fun. So here's one from D Gamma. So there was a big reveal in issue four of Tales of Aether. Was said reveal your idea or a pre-existing one of Dan's or some other Aether team member? That was all Dan. Uh, actually, the whole story of was Dan's, basically. He's got a vision for a lot of what's going on. And then I was brought on to help kind of steer and add to it. But Clarence's story was pretty much already set up. I just had the job of figuring out the details, but yeah, that big reveal at the end, that, that was all him. And when he told me that I'm like, Oh, what are the implications? Uh, uh -oh. Just for context, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Claren, who was added, who's one of the bonus characters. She's not one of the defaults when rivals of Aether was coming out, got a small kind of motion light comic, reveal trailer and at the very end there's this hooded figure who assists her in her time travel into the past and the comic makes it implicitly clear who that character is and why she's around and why she's doing anything and it was just it was fun and when we when doing that issue specifically it's like all right i want to do as many visual callbacks to that trailer because that's what the fans of the series are going to know. And now they're going to get the full story of it and just go nuts with it. So, ah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. If you want to read Tales of Aether, you can either find it on Comixology or you can find it on the Bumble Comic Shop. Alrighty. Hey, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Go read it. Go read it now. Here's a question from the Hobo Joe. This is very much non-official, but I wanted to hear your guys' take. Why, in your opinion, are Sonic and Tails such good friends? Before saying anything, or in Sonic 2, or Tails looking up to Sonic, and Sonic likes the little guy and his gizmos. Then there's the story of them meeting on the beach with the tornado, I think. My memory is failing me, but is that really it? The duo are iconic together, best buds, almost brothers. But aside from that, why? Sonic is amiable, but never really sticks around. Save Eggman shenanigans, and Tails has been the smart one, a la Donatello or Gadget Hackwrench, since adventure. What do they have in common? What do they talk about when they're not adventuring? Do they share hobbies? Why not, say, Knuckles or Amy? Closest I compared to them would be to Doc Brown and Marty Big Fly, and that's essentially the same question. Um, I guess there is a little bit of Doc and Marty there, but, um... In, in a way, the, the, the ages are switched and obviously not nearly as... <laughs> decades apart <laughs> in so far as you have two very different types of people right. just hanging out mm -hmm. um i mean part of it is the protege 
aspect is that Tails looks up to Sonic. And I think there's a degree of res- mutual respect. You know, Tails is the thinking boy and he tries hard and Sonic respects that and wants to encourage it. And I think they both enjoy adventure. They both enjoy flying around. Tails can't necessarily keep up at Sonic's level, but that doesn't matter. They both enjoy the exhilaration of the exploration and the running around. And the fact that Sonic can just go off on his own is more Sonic's thing, not necessarily a knock against the friendship. Yeah. Um, I believe Marty and uh, Marty and Doc were actually explained, though, in the, the game, the Telltale game that came out a few years ago. Okay. And I think also in the comics, which was, I think the comics were mostly retellings of the game. <laughs> <laughs> but still, <laughs> yes. I mean, I think they, it's hard to say because we don't really see them do anything outside of adventuring in the games. Yeah. But I think they share fairly similar interests. I mean, when Sonic is not in movement mode, but is in chill out mode. You know, maybe he does enjoy hanging out on the beach or enjoys a comic book or two with Tails or, you know, maybe he just likes to hear Tails get excited about the latest machine thing. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't necessarily follow it, but Tails is enjoying himself and living it up to its fullest. And he likes that. He likes people being themselves and enjoying their lives. And he'll chill out and bask in that for a minute. And then, oops, it's been a second time to run. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, the... uh... I think the uh, the relationship between those two is it's not very necessarily like detailed. We don't see a whole heck of a lot of it outside of them working together and adventuring together and, you know, going off and saving the day together. But I don't know. There's just something whole, kind of wholesome about it. But uh, yeah, that's that's really it. I don't have anything else to add. I guess Sonic Boom was a good uh, showed them kind of positively together. Sure, it got silly sometimes, but that's Sonic Boom. What do you expect? Here's a question from Drew Maru, a.k.a. Andrew D. Since Fang was confirmed to be a Jerboa Wolf hybrid, have you been given any explanation on how that's possible? I would have assumed in the Archie days that maybe his parents were a wolf and a Jerboa, but now I wonder if that's still possible. Or perhaps he's a hybrid due to some experiment or something else. And I might as well ask if his official name is Fang or if it's still Knack while Fang is his nickname, just like how they did with Robotnik and Eggman. Uh, For his species lineage, I don't know. I am just going to kind of smile and nod at that one. (laughs) Um, I have seen some arguments that even that is something of a mistranslation or miscommunication, but it's not something I'm going to weigh into too heavily and just kind of hang back on he is fang the sniper kind of like with bean there is confusion over is he supposed to be a dynamite ducks is he supposed to be a woodpecker is he actually supposed to be ben or pen i can't remember which one was the green one but you know just kind of dodge the issue and just say he's being the dynamite there you go if, if it's not going to be clear anywhere else just kind of hide under the name and let it be as for his name, I am not 100% sure on this, but I'm thinking Knack just might be kind of retired as a localization thing. It's not like Robotnik, who was so prevalent in Western media and yeah, is the main guy. Fang has been largely non-existent except for the comics, and that is very, very niche. So I'm thinking that it's just kind of like, eh, at one point western stuff called him knack but we're not doing that anymore he's fang uh kind of like he doesn't have three fingers anymore he's got a full hand like everybody else uh, i think it's just he's fang now i think i mean if i get corrected i get corrected but that's what i'm working from going off the last special we did all righty well heck and here's a question from off how come neo metal could go super but heavy king couldn't I know, right? I mean, uh, the boat there, the boat's Bonnie Master Emerald. Just just shows that Mecha Sonic was uh no, excuse me, Neo Metal. Yeah. Not Mecha, Neo Metal. Well, all right, wind it back. I know, right? <laughs> I thought uh, I, I, I guess I thought Neo Metal didn't actually go super. He just 
did a thing while on top of the emerald though i thought that's what was happening he didn't nah, he, he didn't actually he go super, super he didn't nah, actually super. go super off the emerald because didn't you say that i thought you said something about that like he can't actually go super he just did a weird power up thing that was like super but wasn't like is that like see i like a, like how knuckles doesn't get anything from the the emerald and yeah that that weird thing I mean... <laughs> I'm pretty sure we called him Super Neo. I know he's. Per- I know. I'm not saying he's not Super Neo, but <laughs> I'm just saying, like, isn't that one of those weird Sega things? <laughs> if it was, I've forgotten about it. Okay. <laughs> and we got him gold, and we got him super powered. So at yeah. that point, who cares what the minutia is? <laughs> well, a lot um, of people. That's why we have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> As for Heavy King, I actually had misremembered his boss fight in Mania and had it originally scripted as Super, and that got flagged saying he doesn't do it. And I was all indignant and went back to find a YouTube video to say, look, there he goes. And it's like, no, actually, he doesn't. Yeah. Fooey. Darn. How rude. So I, I guess the male hedgehog thing extends to the robots. <laughs> Stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I've heard some pretty stupid things, but man, that's pretty dumb. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, metal gender confirmed? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. 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 Sonic is stupid. Here's a question from Sonic Sonic Sonic. Can you please ask if any of the classic games are still canon to the modern characters' past, and if classic Sonic is Sonic from the past or an alternate dimension version of Sonic, or is the classic world an alternate dimension or a split timeline created by the events of generations? I really don't care what the answer is, as long as I can finally get a real answer from Saga. So please send this question to Saga and get back with a real answer directly from them so we can finally put this classic Sonic discussion to rest. Okay, number one, no. I can't do that. That's not my job. That's not my position. I can't just write up Azuka san and say, "Hey, buddy, what's up? Can you clarify this one question for my podcast?" It, uh, I mean, it, I mean, you've it don't already, work like that. Here's the thing: you've already asked most of these questions <laughs> to Sega, anyway, probably in a lot of ways. <laughs> so, my the the assumption I am working under. Big asterisks there. Do not take this as canon. Is that, yes, the Generations storyline caused a split so that up to that point, it is the past, and now he counts as an alternate past. But I don't know if that's what they're going to stick with because the next game might completely contradict that. I don't know. So... (laughs) Ultimately, Sonic contradict worry. things never, <sighs> never happens when Sega's involved. I wouldn't worry about it because I don't think they're ever going to do a Mega Man classic to Mega Man X style transition. I don't think we're ever going to get our classic Sonic cataclysm and transition hard into the modern style. Uh, my my guess is that classic's going to become a kind of brand, and modern will be a brand, and Every occasion, once in a while, the two will meet with, you know, classic showing up in another modern game. But I don't know. This is all speculation on my part. But I don't know for sure, and I am not in a position to ask anyone directly about it. <laughs> not not to satisfy a podcast, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny, though, because, like, it's just cannot get this cannot get this you cannot get an answer you will never get an answer the answer you get now will be a different answer tomorrow that's that's kind of the thing you got to understand like your real your real answer directly is not necessarily the final answer so just keep that in mind it can always change here's a question from censored no i don't know why they called them that themselves that either I've heard from you that the Freedom Fighters would be voiced by their original voice actors, Tangle would be voiced by Christina V, Whisper would be voiced by Ashley Johnson, and Relic would be voiced by Minnie Driver, but who would voice Fiona Fox and Mina Mongoose? Let's clarify, that was just me spitballing. That's not like anything set hard in stone. 
Like right. if the freedom fighters were to come back and be cast as somebody else, then yay, the freedom fighters are back. Boo that the original voice cast didn't get the work again, but you know, that's... And, and I'm the one who suggested Ashley Johnson for whisper. So yeah. Yeah. So I'm don't take that as Ian confirms. This will be the future. That's that was just spitballing on previous bumble casts. Um, I mean, there are plenty of talented voice actors out there that could do any of those characters. Those are just the ones that have kind of come to mind in casual conversation. Sure. Uh, and returning to that topic, I'm so bad with voice actors. <laughs> I can't immediately think of anyone for Fiona or Mina off the top of my head. Well, for Mina, I can't think of anybody specific for her, but she had, I imagine she would have kind of a similar voice to Amy. So I wouldn't say that she should be voiced by the same actress as Amy, but uh, something similar to that sort of voice could work. Um, as far as Fiona, uh, what about... Um, Gray Delisle doing her Azula voice. <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I can, maybe like a slightly deeper Azula or something. I could, I could see that working. Deeper? Really? Maybe a little deeper. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. She I just, would say. But she just has that. Uh, she just has that level of just absolute smarminess that I think works out. Works really well. For I would her. say not as slow and deliberate as Azula was. Azula's execution was very deliberate and meticulous. That's true, yes. For the most part. And Fiona is much more laid back than that. <laughs> so, a little faster, a little less deliberate, I guess. But yeah, the voice itself, the intonation and the delivery, yeah, I could see that. I'm seeing Erica Limbeck for Tangle, which is a good suggestion. If she weren't voicing Blaze at <laughs> now, that might... That might work, mm. but... She might have the range to do both. Yeah, true, true, but she might also be a pretty decent Mina as well. I could see that. Um, otherwise, Steve Bloom for everybody. Just have him voice the whole <laughs> cast. Why not? See what happens. I like that suggestion. Or Scott McNeil. Just whatever. <laughs> Just put all of them in there. Just put all of them in there. Yo, if Tangle was a dude, Scott McNeil definitely would be the voice. Not even joking. <laughs> yeah, I do say, yeah, I, I agree here. I, the, the chat saying bring back Laura Bailey for Blaze. Yes, I agree. Bring back Laura Bailey for Blaze and make Erica Limbeck Tangle and Christina V. She could be Mina. Why not? Why not? And she can sing, so. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think all of them could sing. <laughs> Just about all the ones we've mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, here's Invade Turbo Tunis with a question. And I'm saying and I'm getting word that I've just made a small portion of the fan base angry. Dude, they don't care what I have to think. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care what I have to say. <laughs> I can say whatever I want. <laughs> All right, here's a question from Invade Turbo Tunis for real this time. Greetings, my homies. I've been thinking. A Sonic and Ratchet and Clank crossover? Ian, I know you're not as knowledgeable of the franchise of RNC, but how would you play out these two pairings if possible? Kylie can jump in on this too. Since I think both series would work wonders together. How would both Doctors Eggman and Nefarious Bromance be involved in the plot? If you don't know who Doctor Nefarious is, he's basically like Eggman or Eggman and Wily combined. Also, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> um See, I don't know anything about Ratchet and Clank aside from one's a cat thing and the other's a robot. Um, and then there's there an alternate be... universe version called Rivet, and I forget who her robot companion's called. And she's voiced by uh, um, Fem Shep, Jennifer Hale. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, who could also be a good Fiona, actually. So, anyway. Sure. Because. Uh, I, I can't even begin to form a basis. I don't know what Ratchet's personality is like. I don't know what Clank is like. I don't know what the tone of their games are. And saying Nefarious is a Eggman Wily combo is 
that just does not compute the, in my head. The, I can't uh, reconcile that. The, um, I have not played Ratchet and Clank, but I've seen a bit of it, and the tone is actually, I would say, on, about in line with Sonic as far okay. as, but it's more of a, the, I don't know. I was going to say the world is a little bit more cyberpunk style and tech, tech, technology driven, but I don't know. That could just be what I've seen. But yeah, it's, it's, he's not too different from Sonic, but it's more, I think there's more spacefaring stuff. Oh, okay. And more, I guess, funnier, comedic, more, more comedic. But I mean, I don't know for sure. It looks like a fun game. I want to play it. It does look like something that's up my alley, but. And guns. Oh, yeah. Lots of guns. <laughs> mm. All the guns. I mean, if it's spacefaring, then I guess that's your introductory angle as they come in from outer space. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how hands on Nefarious is. So is he chasing them down? Are they chasing him? And then it's your typical, you know, meeting of the minds type thing. But this is like such broad strokes. I almost feel. I feel like I'm insulting myself with how generic that is. Uh, I don't know. I really, I wish I could give you a better answer and just kind of have fun with it, but I, I know nothing about Ratchet and Clank, so I can't give you any kind of legitimate or even fun answer. I like how the villain is literally named nefarious. Like, mm. like was he, was he, was he kidding anybody with that one? <laughs> <laughs> That's like uh, calling yourself, calling your entire uh, race the Decepticons. What? <laughs> what? What is this? It'd be fun if they did a like young Frankenstein pull on it. Doctor Frankenstein? That's Frankenstein. Exactly. Doctor Nefarious? Doctor Doctor Nefarious. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and our final priority question for this week comes to us courtesy of Wolf's Bane. Ian, I'm curious how you go about the writing process when you write an arc for Sonic. Could you describe how you form the idea, go through the drafts, and edit it down to the final arc? Do you bounce ideas off Aaliyah, Kyle, Evan, etc.? How involved are the Archie IDW editors? Does an idea come up mid-process that makes you redo everything you've written thus far and make you start over? First of all, I want to clarify, I'm putting this out here, I have never seen a draft... <laughs> I, I've never had any ideas come to me from Ian about this. I have nothing. I have zero. I've had zero involvement with anything comics related. The first time I see the stories is the same time everyone else does. Just putting that yeah. out there. So I'm not. I'm not privy to. Uh, I'm not privy to what's actually going on on the in, insides like that. So I am not a journalist. <laughs> I mean, we work closely together to make Bumblecast happen, but Kyle is not involved with any of my other projects. Not that I'm so. aware of, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, Don't it, check the vat in the basement. It, anything he, for that. If he sneaks in anything that's a reference to me, I don't know about it. <laughs> I have no clue. There's probably think, something in there, but I've never seen it. <laughs> then again, I'm way behind on Sonic comics, so who knows? <laughs> It's not that we just put it out there. I almost feel like a jerk. Yeah, this is Kyle. He's my friend. He helps me a lot with this big project we're working on, but I tell him <laughs> nothing else. No, no, it's fine. Actually, I the thing is, is that usually if I'm wondering about something, I'll just come to you about it. I'll just ask you about it. But you mm. don't, we don't, you don't send me drafts or anything and you don't have to. <laughs> it's not necessary. Well, I can't. That's part of the job. I mean, yeah. <laughs> If I were to do that, I would be in big trouble really fast. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Evan works on the comics, so that makes sense. And Aaliyah can just look over your shoulder, so that's <clears throat> that's that's different. But no, not me. I'm I'm out of it. I don't want to know. Uh, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see what happens as it happens. I don't want the. I don't want the inside. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, to actually answer the question. We'll just stick to the IDW process right now because that's the most current and because we've kind of answered this question in the past. Yeah. But with IDW Sonic, uh, at least the first arc, having come off of the previous incarnations of Sonic comics and being these very long, decompressed, interwoven epics that kept dying on the vine, 
I wanted to do something that was succinct. Like who knows if this book will last? Hopefully it does, but you know, just tell a story and get it done, make it accessible, make it very Sonic centric. So it's something that is fun for new readers, but also kind of fun for the veteran readers who like the minutia and the deep dives into the game lore. So with that hard one year limit, I gave myself, and those criteria is like okay well coming off of forces eggman what happened at the end of forces who knows where is eggman let's play with that let's bring back a villainous force in game that people would like and could be in a fun dynamic way oh let's see if we can get neo metal back okay so neo metal's back what is his plan how does it come about what are we doing with each story how is this introducing new readers to sonic and his world and his friends And just kind of looking at the overall goal, which is Sonic foiling Neo Metal's plan, and how do we get there? Where do we lay the seeds for the big finale? Where do we show the reveals? Who do we introduce where and when and how? And then kind of start, kind of draw the picture first and then color inside the lines, I guess, to draw a very basic analogy. Um, and the biggest changes come along when we get notes back from Sega on what we can and cannot do or what they would prefer to see, because sometimes those are just very small scene changes. And it's like, oh, that's a neat idea. Yeah, let's do that. And sometimes it's we can't access that. It's, OK, so how do we still tell the story and still achieve what we want to achieve without those elements? And nine times out of 10, it's not that hard to work around. Like I wanted Marine to show up at the end of metal virus as the one who finds Sonic unconscious on the beach, but they didn't want a new character quote unquote being introduced at the tail end of a story arc, which I kind of get kind of. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, she wasn't crucial to the story and i still got my little nod in there with sonic referencing a precocious little girl so it's kind of in there but um the process itself is we've detailed it on so many episodes but it is a lot of back and forth and cooperation with the editors and with sega themselves to see if the story structure works if it's interesting if it's engaging uh, if, if it's reasonable if it's in theme and yeah just the back and forth of the creative process. That's all there is. There's not much I can really add that we haven't already covered a few times. Yeah. And then you, um, you got to do breakdowns, right? You, that's your initial submission is. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. The stage one is the breakdowns. Those yeah. page by page sentence synopses. Mm-hmm. And then the first draft and then the revised draft and however many revisions it takes to get it fully approved. Yeah. Yep. I knew that much. See, I know things here and there occasionally. Head over to bumbleking.com. I have a number of FAQs that covers that sort of thing. And again, check out the Q and a master list. We we've talked about the process a bunch on this show. Indeed. And you can do that while we're on break right now. We're taking a break real quick. We'll be right back. Time to get into the standard Q&A, starting off with one from Lucas R. In the Archie comics, it is shown that Sonic can vibrate his molecules to become intangible. Can he do this easily, and for how long do you think he can do that? For as long as the plot requires it. Pretty much. Same Uh, for the Flash. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's where that was inspired from, I'm sure. Absolutely. I think he only did it, like, twice? Yeah. Yeah. And it almost surely was a flash reference both times. Yeah, it was a narrative ass poll, but I would say not very long because if he were able to do that, he would just be completely broken. Like forget about modern Sonic's boost being able to turn intangible and warp through things is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sonic with the speed force. Can you imagine? (laughs) <laughs> uh, Cassidy J has a question 
I know Rough and Tumble have a power called Stink Bomber and Grand Stink Bomber. Is it like actual skunk spray and how a skunk sprays in real life, but with a spin dash? I'm just curious. Here's the thing. <laughs> uh, I don't want to imagine a real skunk spin dash. <laughs> that sounds frightening. <laughs> um, the notes we got back on Ruff's abilities are very specific. The characters cannot emit liquid. Uh, so <laughs> we can't they don't say anything act- about stench. <laughs> so the his skunk spray abilities are very much the passive just kind of cartoonish gas cloud thing it is not like the actual skunk spray Uh i'm imagining it as do you remember in lava reef zone the toxamisters the little pole badniks that had that cloud yeah, that, of gas yes. that would hold on to you drain rings. Yes. Basically I'm thinking that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm kind of like with Rough and Tumble, I was actually thinking of them as a boss fight character. What if they were in a game? Mm-hmm. And to have this attack sequence where Ruff is just kind of like doing the bounce maneuver that Sonic has. And each time he does, there's an impact wave that creates that cloud. And if you get caught in it, you would drain rings. If not, just get hit outright. Like maybe you get hit outright and then you're stuck with a cloud and you have to spin dash it off or you stay out of range. And then after he's tired himself out, you get a bop in and you go from there. So don't think of it as legitimate animal biologics. Think of it as cartoon gas cloud. Confirmed. Sonic characters do not go to the bathroom. Nope. Nope. They don't go to the bathroom. They don't have blood. No blight. No bleeding. Nope. How are they alive? Who knows? Magic. Cartoon magic. I don't know. I don't know. Here's a question from Atomic Fox 64. Do you know if Paramount had to follow any Sega mandates like you? If so, were they as strict? In the film, when Sonic is running on the baseball field, he almost cries and gets pretty emotional, and I'm sure with Sega's mandates, that original Manhog would have never been approved. Despite this, the fact that Longclaw isn't Sonic's actual mother lines up with the Sega's no familiar relationships rule. I don't know directly, but I have heard that there was a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say friction, but a degree of back and forth over what could and couldn't be done to a certain degree. There's also the factor that this is paramount. They are a big old movie studio. They have way more influence than the tiny little tie-in comic. So when you have a movie studio that can have global impact and is throwing around millions of dollars, say, we want to do this, that goes a lot farther than one hairy fat dude at a computer saying i want to write this there's different scenarios there um i thought it was interesting myself watching the movie and seeing how sonic speed was depicted Mm -hmm. what they did with you know just every aspect of his characterization and backstory they had a lot of latitude and i would imagine that's primarily because you don't fight hollywood i i'm think it did sega kind of just give them the license and they just kind of had a carte blanche with it for the most part kind of like uh kind of like maybe with godzilla 98 when (laughs) when that happened or the super mario brothers movie kind of no i know sega is aware of the movies and has some input but there's also from my understanding a degree of understanding on their end that this is the movie. The movie is going to be kind of its own thing. Sure. I suppose. Take that with a grain of salt because I'm not involved with the movie. So all I've heard is like second and third hand rumor. I could be completely wrong. Yeah. Hmm. I'm kind of wondering. I'm kind of wondering just how much input they actually have had though. Hmm. Maybe someday there'll be like a documentary on it or something. Somebody should do that. Mm. I'm kind of curious. You'd think with the with the massive, massive outcry that happened with the uh, initial design that uh, like a, some kind of documentary or even a book would be 
interesting. Kind of like the the uh, console wars book with Sega and Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Kind of see how Sega and Paramount <laughs> and what happened with that. So could be interesting, but I don't know. Probably in like another twenty years. Here's a question from Dominic R. If you have the time, I wanted to type you a question regarding writing for franchise characters. You've breathed such life into these comics, especially the universe run. I know Sega comes in and vetoes creative decisions that you work with a more minimal palette than you probably want. But somehow, you never made it seem like that. You took these characters that had to be somewhat static for branding purposes and still painted such a believable, enticing, character-driven drama with them. The world we live in is quickly losing originality. I fear I will be, and as a fan, somewhat look forward to writing for projects that are never original ever again. I want to know if you had any advice on writing for franchises. Like, how can I take a character like Sonic or his friends, who already has a whole setup ahead of them, and write a logline that will make a reader go, yes, this has bite. This is using the characters to their fullest, because your work is full of those. Stories where Shadow wants to reason with robots, because there's another weapon he relates Stories where Silver goes to an alternate Enerjack-controlled future. Stories where King Max is seen as the more complex, divided ruler he always was. Um, Sonic is kind of unique in that regard. And we've talked on the show in the past about, oh, rules this and cutbacks that and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, there really is a lot of creative latitude on Sonic. I got to be honest. And that's not me backpedaling to appease the masters it's you know i got to with metal virus i got to do a child-friendly version of the zombie apocalypse in a sonic book that's that's crazy man Mm -hmm. the just to be able to do that at all that storyline alone is huge creative freedom and with each stage i was kind of seeing just how much latitude we were given you know can we show title characters being infected can we show them being changed can sonic himself be infected that was huge when that got approved so yes there are frustrations every now and again and there are times where i think that it might have been better in another way but we are given a great deal of creative latitude the fact that we can add characters to this mix like tangle and whisper and clutch and all them and they're they have to go through approval process but they are approved is a huge deal so i would say that sonic is almost the outlier when it comes to franchise books just in that how much we're able to do with it i didn't I, i i fell off of the power rangers book wagon a long time ago i need to catch up on that again but that kind of had that feel to it as well, that they were given a lot of creative latitude to just play with the mythos. So maybe that's the trend now. Maybe things are starting to loosen up and the and licenses are allowing people to tell more creative stories with the material, so long as they you know fit. Right. But I guess the crux of your question is, how do you do that? How do you make it fit? How do you take somebody else's property and do something with it without just making it an ad or going by the numbers. And I feel like part of it is you need to understand what the franchise is. You don't necessarily have to be a big fan of it, but you need to do at least a little bit of research. Do your due diligence. Who are the characters? What are their relations with the rest of the cast? What is the themes and the tone of the world? And what has the franchise already done? And what has it not done? You know, what questions are still out there to be answered? Or if you're looking at this character and say, okay, what if you put them in this scenario? How would they react? If the franchise hasn't already done it, you explore it and see if the licensor is keen with you doing that. It really will depend on who is in control and just how much latitude they will give you. You're going to work on a license, but it, if you go freelance like I am and you get a licensed book and the licensor is super hands-on and super protective of it, you're only going to get to do so much. You're going to have to more or less, you're the short order cook in their kitchen. 
they tell you to make it this way and you're going to have to make it that way. And you may not be satisfied with it, but you also get to pay your light bill that month. Uh, other ones like Sonic, like the Aether series, where they give you a lot more latitude, you get to just, you get to have fun with it. Like when I'm looking at a Sonic story, I'm asking myself, what kind of story would I like to read? What is going to be interesting and fun and engaging to me? What questions do I want answered? What stories do I want to see told as someone who enjoys Sonic? And thankfully I've been able to do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So there's not like, it's hard to really define what the approach should be. I guess it's if, if you are on a property that you enjoy, that, you know, ask yourself, what do you want to see from it? You know, what, what has the license not, what has the series not provided that you want to see done and see if you can do that. And, you know, then the challenge becomes make sure that you keep it in bounds you can't just make it your story and, you know, use it as a Trojan horse to tell something else. Cause then you're not telling your, you're not telling a Sonic story at that point. You're telling your story and that go do an indie book. That's, it's a free country. Go out there, create, mm -hmm. you know, tell your story that is, you know, a Sonic story, but make sure that it feels like a Sonic story. Make sure that it actually fits within its themes and its tone. And that's what the licensor is there for is to tell you whether or not you're sticking to uh, that criteria that, it, that you're making it feel like a Sonic product. And in that case, that's when the licensor really is a big help. Yeah. I think Sega is maybe kind of realizing, because we've mentioned it many, many, many a time on the show, that uh, Sonic has a lot of potential that is just untapped. And I think maybe Sega is starting to realize that it might be good to maybe kind of start tapping some of that potential. I hope. <laughs> so, yeah. I think it's working out pretty well, though. It's working out pretty, pretty well. Here's a question from Christine P. Can you give me an idea of what is and is not negotiable in a work for hire contract when working for a company like IDW or your previous co company, Archie? Do you get paid royalty still for your old work or is that something that is non-negotiable once the contract ends? Uh, freelancers typically don't negotiate. No. Nope. You are picked up for a project and you're told, here's the contract, here's the rate. You complete the project and that's it. You get paid for your work done and nothing else. Yeah. Um, Dark Horse is the only company I've worked with that offers royalties past a certain threshold. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, that was on the arms book. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nintendo, Dark Horse, whoever was involved on that. No, how dare you? No! <laughs> no. But no. No, everything I've done with Archie, everything I've done with IDW, everything I've done for everybody else, uh, if it goes into reprint or anything, I don't see a dime from that. That's just the nature of the contract. Yeah. Um if you get to be a big name in the industry, and I'm talking like big name, like someone that your non-comic reader may have heard of hmm. then you might be able to say here is my personal rate can you match it but 99% of the folks out there if if you can land a gig you're just happy to have the gig yes and <laughs> i think i think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that it's kind of a it, it, uh... it's not my favorite thing about the comic industry or any freelance industry is that you're not paid for sales you're just paid for the job you've done and that's it but that's just kind of how it works and no yeah. unfortunately you're one tiny cog in a larger machine you can't really you know you're not the one you can't be the driving force behind that change completely just as a single person so like for for comparison's sake i am not one of those big names remotely no like I've, I have been kind of the voice for Sonic books for 15 years. I have no power at the negotiating table, none. And that isn't to say anything nasty about 
IDW because they're perfectly nice people. And, the, you know, the editors I work with, they are not the ones who make the decisions on that sort of thing. So uh, that's just how it is. It's it's for higher contract work. I fulfill the contract and that's it. Mm -hmm. Would it be nice if I got some residuals off of that? Sure. Sure it would. But that's just not what the contract is. And I knew that going in. And yes, that's the choice I've had to make is do I want to work on this franchise that I enjoy and do it for a pretty good rate? Then, yeah, that's my decision. And if I want to do something more within my control that would, you know, had any benefits reaped solely by me, I will create my own, which I'm kind of doing now. Yes. So, yes. so it goes. <laughs> There's some people who could, who could uh, still do have learned that route, learned that, uh, learned that thing, learned that well, that's, uh, uh, a decade uh, that's ago, there. but we're not going there. No, we are not because we have two more questions. Here's one from Rich the Echidna. Hi, a question for the Bumblecast. Which is the best version of Sky Chase? Sonic 2, Pocket Adventure, Sonic 4, Episode 2, Sonic Adventure 1, or Unleashed 360? Hmm. Here's the thing. Hmm. Unleash 360, I'm not familiar with. Didn't get that far. All the other ones? I'm gonna, yeah, I know that. I'm not familiar with Pocket Adventure. Hmm. Pocket Adventure is basically just Sonic 2 rehashed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Unleashed is off the list entirely. Okay. Because that is a kind of rhythm pattern button masher, and it's not fun at all. I hate it. Mm -hmm. Um you do it twice in the game and I'm very happy that you never have to do it again. You have the option to go back and do it. I'm like, why <laughs> and I have, I have a friend who never finished unleashed cause he just couldn't get the timing down on it. And the game is locked behind completing it. So, Oh, well, Oof. you know, you don't have anything like it beforehand. You don't do anything like it again until the second round, which is barely any different from what I remember. So yeah, no, it's, it sucks. I hate that one. Uh, original Sky Chase is always going to be dear to my heart just because it was so different. And, you know, it just, it has that special place in my heart. All of a sudden you're in the sky, you're running on the plane. It's neat. Yeah, it's a very different level from the rest in the game. Um, it's also, like, after the absolute slog that is the ultra, ultra long Metropolis zone, Sky Chase is literally a breath of, breath of fresh air. <laughs> so I would say Mirage Saloon Act 1 is a better version of that. Yeah. But, and I'm always going to be a Sonic 4 Episode 2 apologist. And one of the reasons is the Sky Chase and that was fun. Like, you get to use the tornado itself. And you get a boss fight against Metal Sonic in a cool cannon carrier flying thing. So, I don't know. I, I put, I put yeah. Sonic 2 and Episode 2 on par, but for completely different reasons. I don't remember Sonic 4 Episode 2 at all. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being a lot of rehashes of, of previous games in a less inspired way. But I just, I don't know. I never, I never liked it. No, no. Yeah, episode episode one was it. episode one was the retread stuff. Episode two had new content. Kind of, sort of. Still wasn't very good. <laughs> I liked it. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather play Pocket Adventure, which is just a Sega, another Sega, another Master System slash Game Gear game, but it's on a, it's on the Neo Geo handheld instead. It's a good game, actually. I like it a lot, but it is very much a rehash of Sonic 2 with Sonic 3's music, which is interesting. An interesting mix. <laughs> um, I have a soft spot for Adventure 1 just because it is pretty much just afterburner. <laughs> if, if you're familiar with the Sega arcade classic afterburner, Sonic Adventure 1 is pretty much... Sonic Adventure 1's Sky Chase is pretty much just afterburner. And uh, so that has a soft spot in my heart. But Sonic 2, Sonic 2 is always, I'm always going to go with the classics, man. That's just me. That's just me, though. I'm just like that. Oh, well. We got one last question from Dove. Everyone keeps asking about money in Sonic's world. Well, here's my question. Does Monopoly exist in Sonic's world? Huh. 
Why not? It's fake money. I don't think it could. Somebody knows what money is because the chaotics know what money is. Well, yeah, but but they don't have any. General, they don't have any. But it might be it. It might be a human game because the animal people don't have a concept of land ownership or currency. Mm. Maybe that's why the chaotics know about money is they live near human settlements. I don't know. I'm trying to rationalize something that has no rationalization. <laughs> what? Crazy. You're trying to say Sonic's irrational? You're right. It's very irrational. Ugh. <laughs> Does Monopoly exist in Sonic's world? Yes. Eggman has a ro- has a monopoly on evil. Try that. How about that? Monopoly on robot manufacturing. Sonic wants to play as the boot, and he's sad that it isn't a speed boot. What do you mean I can't just run across the board, Sonic? That's not how the game is played. Mm-hmm. 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 PC the Unicorn in the chat says, I am irrational. As in me, Kyle. He says, you're irrational, Kyle. It's like, yes, I am. Have you heard this show? I'm very irrational. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, speaking of being irrational, we're done. I, I, I don't know how that's related to being irrational, but we're done anyway. That's pretty we're irrational. Done the, we're done with the question. So here we go. We are. And before we, I lose my voice and we wrap up the show, we're going to give a big thank you to everyone who makes it possible. The show, not my voice. <laughs> big thank you to... Daniel H. Alex P. James K. John B. Jennifer R. Robotnik Holmes. Samuel P. Sam Cybercat. Torchbound. Justin G. Mike B. Coupling Crew. One twenty eight. Do his dis den. Diane W. Bradley T. T. Andrew D. Scruffy Matt. Chris A. Sony. John M. Salute your cat. Noni. Don B. Yami M. Dave M. Sin Fritz. Lee H. K. Off. Lisa M. Chevelle. Silly String. J. Frost. Piggy Bank. Blue Title Gamer. Jib. Hero of Light 13. Justin S. Tick Tick. Final Leo. Digama F. Well. Ryan D. Speedweed. Jonathan D. Rachel W. Godzilla. Chaos Universe. Sonic Legacy. Daniel B. Dadler the Dalek. BC the Unicorn. Dove. Preston M. Sonic Sonics. Sonic. Red the Supernamic. Fiona M. Joe S. Flixie. Chad. Jonathan R, Owen B D, Chase L, Renard Pixel, Creative Name, Les, Sapphire Scarletta, Turbo, Cooker, Danny Light, John the Real Waluigi, Louis J, Noah S, Invade Turbo Tunis, Censored, Lexi D, Corjiro Highwind, Wolfsbane, Scurvy Pirate Hog, and Unknowing Frown. Hmm. Wow. Lots of new names. Thank you for coming aboard, everybody. Where can the people find you on the internet, Ian? Find me on Twitter at Ian Flynn BKC and check out my website, BumbleKing.com. That is the Bumble Comic Shop where you can buy comics signed by me because I am not doing conventions what well, with the plague going around. You can get the <laughs> full Tales of Aether series digitally and every month there's some kind of discounted deal going on. So make sure to check it out. You can also find the BumbleCast Q&A master list there. Make sure to check it out and see if your question has already been answered. Kyle, what about you? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at KyleJCRB, where things go down sometimes on occasion. You can also find me over at KNGI.org. That's where all the archived episodes of the Bumblecast live in MP3 downloadable format for your listening pleasure. You can also find me on Nitro Game Injection, streaming live on Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If you enjoy video game music, especially of the remixed, arranged, and uh, uh, remixed variety, did I say remixed? I might have said remixed. You did. I, I Yeah. Well, you, I said remixed twice. So there you go. Yeah, that's, that's where you can listen to those. Especially, I, I play a lot of Sonic music. Because I love Sonic music. So, yeah. Follow the show on Twitter at Bumblecast. Email us at Bumblecast at Yahoo.com. And listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, our YouTube channel, and KNGI.org. And also, the Bumble Store is open for all your Bumble needs. So go check it out. Shop.spreadshirt.com slash Bumble store. You're going to need, you're going to need that mask probably. So head on over there and get one or anything else you want. I mean, I don't know. You can put our, you can put our logo on whatever you want. Do it. Do it now. That's going to wrap us up. Be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And we'll see you next week for more Bumble guest. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Yeah. All right. Uh, yep. 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 Everything is fine. <laughs> Get the cobwebs out. Everything is fine. Nothing is ruined. Nothing will go wrong. <laughs> Nothing will go wrong. <coughs> okay. Because my ears are filled with coughing. I'm so sorry. It is fine. I'm just 
uh, making an observation. Also, stop eating the cobwebs, yes. <laughs> I can't help it. The spiders crawl in there when I sleep. Uh huh. <laughs> That's definitely what happens. You eat eight spiders a night, or however many it is. <laughs> I mean, where are they during the day? Who knows? But at night, man, they come right out. Mm -hmm. They're just all over your bed. <laughs> Somehow. Uh, that's disgusting. Somehow. <laughs> I warmed up before the show because I knew that's how I was going to open it, but I think I still managed to burn myself you, down a little bit. Did you? <laughs> your, your Flynn heart you, you, went too far? Poor Flynn or heart. did it not go far enough? Uh, you know what? You can bank on me because I'm cash, baby! <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't do that. <laughs> no. Maybe don't do that anymore. For now. No. For now. No. You've been listening to the Bumblecast, a co-production of Bumble King Comics and the KNGI Network. Original theme music composed by Ken Coda Snyder. Remixed intro by T Lopes. Find out more information, along with podcast feeder links, MP3 downloads, and more at bumbleking.com and kngi.org. And now people are wondering what Sonic games you've beaten in 100%ed. Oh, not many. <laughs> <laughs> well, legitimately or not? I don't know. Like the the beaten beaten legitimately only starts at adventure. No, that's not true. S that's three and K, because that is a safe feature. <laughs> yeah. That helps. <laughs> oh, for me, uh Sonic One, C D, Sonic Two, Sonic Three and Knuckles, and Chaotix, I've all I've hundred percented on all all of them. Uh Adventure 2, Adventure 1 and 2, beaten them, but not 100%ed them. Heroes, I 100%ed. You will guys watch me do it. <laughs> uh, Shadow, does getting one of the endings count as beating it? I don't know. Yeah. I guess. 2006, never even played it. Unleashed, uh, never got past the first boss because I was frustrated and not in the mood to play it, I guess, and then just never went back to it. <laughs> Colors I've beaten... Not 100%ed, though. Generations, I 100%ed. Lost World, I've beaten, and I'm never playing it again. <laughs> Mania, I've beaten, but not 100%ed. I should, but I have not. And Forces, I've beaten... Forces, yeah, actually, I think I have 100%ed Forces, because it's not very long and not very hard. Mm -mm. Unless you want to count, like, all S ranks or whatever as 100%, I don't know, but... Well, yeah, yeah, I guess you would, but if you're, but like, all I'm, completionist, but... Yeah, I mean, <sighs> I don't really consider it that, but... No, the Adventure 1 and 2, the only reason I haven't... I wouldn't consider myself having 100% of those is because I didn't mess with the Chow Garden in either one. <laughs> mm. 